We respond really well to natural disasters, but the water supply is a slow-moving emergency. Are we responding to it fast enough? We'll talk about that next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF. This is Global Perspectives, with Pulitzer Prize-winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. Environmental issues are of greater concern than ever today, with climate change drawing the most attention. But other issues also proliferate, including access to clean water. Some estimates suggest that nearly a billion people struggle to obtain clean water. What's worse, they are regularly exposed to health problems such as waterborne diseases and other risks. Children are especially vulnerable. How do we fix this problem? What are businesses and nonprofits already doing? And what is the best way to help those most in need? The children. Our guest today, Peter Thum, is the founder of Ethos Water, a bottled water company that raises funds and awareness for clean water programs around the world. In 2008, Thum founded GivingWater.org, a nonprofit that also seeks answers to the world water crisis. Hello, Mr. Thum. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Tell us about the water problem, uh, just in, in general, and then we'll talk about how you got into wanting to come up with solutions. Well, your summary was pretty good. I think the world, the world water crisis affects, uh, in terms of clean water access, uh, right around a billion people, a little bit more than a billion people around the world by some estimations. And access to adequate sanitation services affect about 2.4 billion people around the world. And those numbers, while uh, international and bilateral organizations are seeking to reduce those numbers as well as NGOs, our population is growing at the same time. So um, we have two opposing forces, our efforts to slow that down and the growth of the population. So how did this come to your attention? Is this something that has always concerned you? Or did you wake up one day and say, I, I want to do something different, and I suspect that water is at the center of it? How did, how did your interest develop? For me, it began about 10 years ago when I was working on a business project in South Africa and ended up meeting people who were living without access to clean water and sanitation. And so they spent a tremendous amount of their time looking for water, and I saw lots of people, but mainly women and girls, out spending this time trying to get water for their daily lives, and I recognized it as a big problem. And obviously, this problem is prolific across Africa, and it's, it's a big problem around the rest of the world as well. So what, what was your first step? Did, did you talk to people who were in the field? Did you go out and do your own research? Um, did you have a readily available group of individuals who said, this, this is a worthy cause, we'll join you? Well, it was. In terms of having the experience, it was pretty simple. I got to know people who talked to people who were looking for, for water, uh, hauling water uh, to their communities and their families in South Africa. And then uh, when I went back to England, where I was living at the time, I did another project. Uh, I was working as a consultant at the time for a company that made uh, soda, bottled water. And so for me, the next step was to recognize that there might be an opportunity to create a business, a, a, a brand in the bottled water business that would compete with Evian and Fiji and very high-end water brands like that and event basically offer a similar emotional benefit, but one which was about buying a product that would fund a solution for water for other people. And how did you come up with the name? Uh, I came up with the name for Ethos by coming up with about a hundred names and that was the one that I liked the best and that seemed to make the most sense from for me uh, for the brand and I was very surprised to find out that no one had actually gotten the rights for that and so I filed for the rights and ultimately that became the name of the company. And, and how did it work from the beginning? Was this something that uh, was successful right off or did it take some time? Well, uh, my friends actually suggested, because I was so concerned about this issue, I told people about the, the world water crisis that 
my experiences in, in South Africa. And, and they said, well, you should start a charitable organization and raise money. And to me, that I understood what they meant, but it didn't seem like the right solution because in the water crisis wasn't like uh, breast cancer or HIV where you were, were confronted by people or met people on a daily basis or knew people throughout your experience who had suffered from this situation. Most people in Europe and the United States had never been without clean water. And so these countries being some of the countries that have the greatest ability to fund solutions for these problems really were operating in, in pretty much lack of awareness of, of the problem. And so I thought uh, a solution that made people aware was much more important. And so that's where this idea was born from. And at the beginning, uh, I tried to start it as a nonprofit, but it didn't work. Investors weren't interested because it had this charitable component. And foundations, although they have the ability to invest in things like this, weren't interested either. And so ultimately, it ended up becoming a for-profit business with very small amounts of seed money. And we seeded the company essentially out of our own pockets. And it took two and a half years to get to the point where we could operate the business. And how did the, the, the broad community that had issues with access to clean water, how did they benefit from the success of the company? Well, the model was pretty simple. So each, initially, each bottle would donate a portion of the profits. Originally, we set the number at 50%. And then uh, over time, uh, we changed the way that the economics work just because of the way that the economics are monitored in the United States. So it became, we were going to change it to become something like two cents per unit sold, uh, which worked out to be about the same for our startup company as 50% of profits. But then right around the same time, Starbucks Coffee Company bought, bought Ethos. They came to us and said, we're interested in acquiring the brand, and we were trying to get them as a customer. And so they were able to increase significantly the amount of money we were, we were donating. And so the way that we actually set the company up, we had a, a for-profit company, and we had a not-for-profit uh, corporation, and we were donating money from the company into the not-for-profit and then using that to fund projects around the world. You actually became a Starbucks official for a while. Yes, so following the, the acquisition of the company, the brand by Starbucks, uh, everyone who worked for Ethos then became an employee of Starbucks. And over time, people left, but uh, we all were working there for some period of time after the acquisition. And so both I and my business partner worked as executives and joined the Starbucks Foundation Board and helped them implement a set of programs that would allow them to figure out how to fund water projects on an ongoing basis. And you, you talked about how you first learned about this simply from talking to people and seeing the conditions in which they lived. Um, have you gone back and, and seen your efforts through Ethos Water uh, helping people, including the ones you got to know? I have. Uh, not back in South Africa. We actually haven't had any projects in South Africa. Uh, but we have projects in Asia, Latin America, across different countries in Africa. And so I've visited quite a few of those projects before leaving. And I've met thousands of people who were beneficiaries of the programs that we invested in. And so that's a very rewarding part of it. But I think probably the greatest impact that Ethos Water has had wasn't just my own personal experience or even that on the, on the people who receive uh, water, but rather on the, the impact on the awareness of people in North America. Mm -hmm. Because probably between 70 and 100 million people have bought Ethos Water, and some large percentage of those people are now aware that water is a problem and have actually, through their purchases, contributed to giving water to people. Oftentimes, when I work with international projects in various places, there's a, a person or a group that, uh, that, that seems to, to stay with me long after the project has passed. Is, is there a, a, a person, we talk so much about the children who are the most vulnerable in, right. this, in this context, is there a child somewhere who, who touched you in some way, who, who inspired you to keep going and to aspire to even more with your project? I don't know that I would pick one single person. There was a little girl I met in Indonesia about five years ago who uh, was in a school where they, they didn't have toilets, and so we had funded a project for her school and about 750 other schools through Mercy Corps. And so the students in this school received, they had, we built toilets for them at their school for the first time, 
and gave them deworming medication so that they could actually get the parasitic worms that were in their system out of their systems. And in her case, we, we wanted to see one person's experience and how this had changed their life, so we actually went with her back with, to meet her parents and see what, it, what, involved, what was involved for her because she didn't have a toilet at school. And she literally would, if she had to go to the bathroom, she would walk a mile and a half home and go to the bathroom and then come back. And so on a daily basis, you can imagine for a nine-year-old girl what that means. Uh, if you have to go to the bathroom twice in one day, you miss most of the school day. And so I think in her case, and, and, and certainly for many of the other children who were involved in that program, it changed their lives significantly. And I have thousands of other experiences where I've met kids and had a chance to, in the cases where we had an interpreter, get to talk with them and understand how it affected their lives. There was a specific school in Kenya where we had installed a well in their village, but they didn't have water at the school and so I said, personally, I will find a way to, if you can get the rights to build a well, I'll find you the water. And the, we raised the money and built a well at that school. And that was the initiating project for Giving Water, which was the uh, not-for-profit organization I started. And we've funded programs for about 1,000 students in the, after, after Ethos uh, in the same areas where we've done projects through Ethos. Have you found that your projects um, inspire other projects? Do, do people who are the recipients of, of benefits then go out and try to help others? You know, it's a very interesting question. Uh, there, are, Almost everywhere we go, we have met with people in communities who have been beneficiaries of investments that we've made, and they talk to us about the fact that people around them in other communities also need programs, and they're very open about that. I, th I think that to some extent that's because these communities are neighboring communities. Sometimes, for example, one of the communities we did a program in, in Honduras, the people in the community said, we were very happy that you did a project for us to give us all access to water, but really the people in the neighboring community needed the water much more than we did. And there were some reasons why we couldn't do a project in that community at that time, political reasons that I think have since been ironed out and someone else has implemented a program for them. Uh, but there's, there's a tremendous sense of community around water because people realize to some extent that they're all in it together. What about on, on, the, on the U.S. side? You, you said this project has helped build awareness about water problems around the world. Mm -hmm. Has it encouraged um, people, young people, people of other ages to want to become involved, to, to try to be part of the solution? It's hard to track the specific impact from an awareness and action perspective that Ethos has had. Certainly it has. I know that people who run non-governmental organizations, not-for-profits in the U.S. that do work in this field have said to me that one of the primary reasons that people cite for their awareness of the water crisis as they become donors is the fact that they learned about it through Ethos Water. I think that, you know, we were having this conversation earlier. I think it's also a bit difficult to, to unwind for young people today. Their motivations for doing things uh, f uh, from a media perspective, whether it's ethos water or something that they see in the media, uh, from their generational motivations. I think young people today are highly motivated to go out and try and do something about the community and the world around them. What, what would be a logical next step? Once you build awareness, once you hopefully inspire some people, even if you can't measure it, uh, what, what would be the next step in, in this kind of effort? What would you hope to, uh, to accomplish? Well, in the case of Ethos Water, I, I hope that Starbucks continues to operate the company. I hope they expand the brand into other product categories. Um, and that's all of their responsibility now because they own the brand. I think from the perspective of awareness being increased in the United States, you can look at examples of organizations like Charity Water, which is a New York-based not-for-profit organization that has grown double digits year on year for many years now since I think it's founding in 2006. And it's now quite a sizable organization, and it didn't even exist when Ethos Water already had been sold. And I think to some extent the awareness that has contributed to their uh, ability to raise money, which is perfect, 
um, has come from Ethos Water. I think uh, water.org, which was uh, the collaboration between Gary White, who's been working in water for 25 years, and Matt Damon, um, is doing great things in terms of raising awareness. And Charity Water and water.org are, to some extent, very they're different versions of the same approach to uh, making people aware of the issue and uh, making people excited about it and then showing them that their donations can actually deliver a solution. And so I think Ethos Water stimulates awareness and does some economic investment. And these organizations that use more traditional models of, of fundraising can raise much more significant amounts of money. You spend a fair amount of time in college and university environments. Do you find in your travels that, generally speaking, these institutions are paying enough attention to this kind of issue? And is there a, a way to, to bring water and other critical environmental concerns into the daily conversation or into the, con into the curriculum at these schools? I think this goes back, uh, or my answer goes back to a conversation we were having earlier, which is that I think in many cases the students themselves are driving the demand for these kinds of programs. Uh, and that they are very acutely aware of the environment as, a, as an issue. I think it's probably their number one concern. And uh, Issues around water are environmental issues, but they all, they're also humanitarian issues. And so I think this specific field of the intersection between environmentalism and humanitarian issues hasn't been explored as well as it could be, primarily because here in the United States we focus on the environment to some extent as a silo, uh, whereas in the rest of the world for much larger specific environmental reasons, but also for socioeconomic reasons, political reasons, those two intersections happen much more readily. Well, tell us about some of your newer projects beyond Ethos. What, what are some of the uh, new initiatives that uh, sure. compel you? So uh, about three years ago, I founded Giving Water, uh, which is a not-for-profit organization, which to date works uh, specifically in the Samburu region of Kenya. And we fund school-based water and sanitation programs for to date about 1,100 students and we're about to make another grant through International Medical Corps to expand that program. And about two and a half years ago uh, with a, my business partner uh, who I met at the TED conference, we started to think about this, uh, a question that had sort of confronted both of us while we were working and traveling in Africa, which was the, the prevalence and use of assault rifles. And so we started to think, what could we do about the issue of assault weapons in, in Africa? And that has led us to found a company called, a, a, a social venture called Fondali Calonset, which is in English Foundry 47. And what we do is we collect and destroy AK-47s in Africa, reduce them to the raw steel from which they're made, and then give that steel to very fine designers who make jewelry and watches and accessories out of it. And then the purchases of those pieces then fund more weapon destruction back in Africa. So for example, this is one of the rings that we make. It's made of AK-47 steel and gold. And the purchase of the ring funds the destruction of 75 assault rifles back in Congo. I was wondering, do you have any sense of how many weapons you've taken out of circulation, just ballpark? So to date, the number is a little bit north of 6,000. Uh, assault rifles of, of all kinds, not just AK-47s. We work with an organization right now called Mines Advisory Group in Democratic Republic of Congo, and we are on track to get to about 10,000 weapons by February. It sounds like all of these projects collectively would make great material for a book. <laughs> is that something that is uh, in the works? or? Well, least... I have friends uh, who have said I should write a book. I haven't... Uh, I'm a little bit busy right now doing things instead of writing things. So uh, we'll see if that ever happens. But right now I'm, I'm busy. I've got uh, a not-for-profit that I run. I have a not, another not-for-profit and a for-profit that I, I, I'm the CEO of. And uh, I'm on three boards. So I have a lot of doing to do right now. When you look back to the, to the beginning of this effort, when you were first thinking about water issues, did you hope to be approximately where you are and where we are in terms of dealing with them? 
um, or are you frustrated that we haven't moved quickly enough? I'm not frustrated. I, I'm very happy with what has happened with Ethos Water, and I think it has played its role, and it has stimulated a lot of awareness. I think water is a very complicated issue. I think human beings tend to respond to disasters and pressure and pain, and I don't think we're quite feeling the pain of water availability and water economics yet. You see that in the United States probably more than almost anywhere else where we use water for to grow things that we shouldn't be growing in places where we shouldn't be growing them. And so until the time comes that the amount of available resources that we have to buy uh, water for ourselves is so constrained that you see situations like we see periodically in the southeast around Atlanta and, and some of the other major cities in the southeast until that becomes widespread enough that people really have to suffer that I think here in the United States we'll continue to, to ignore water as a, as a serious issue. And that, that will create our own problem. Now, inevitably, of course, that, that pressure will come for everyone. The, yes. the, you referenced the, the growth of the world's population. And if the estimates are correct, that's going to continue to, uh, to grow for several decades before it eventually stabilizes. And we already probably have more, more people than we can work with in, in a sustainable way. Uh, wh what happens when we get to that pressure point? Uh, do we, is conflict inevitable? Is, uh... Well, people have predicted uh, wars over water f for quite a long time uh, and have talked or have at least couched some of the conflict that we have already, certainly in the Middle East, in the, in the context of, of water wars. Uh, I don't know that they're inevitable, but water is, is a necessity for human life and it is an economic good, and uh, people already do use power to obtain access to water as a resource. And so as it becomes more constrained, it wouldn't be surprising if that were to happen. I think you have the complexity of the climate change issue, which is that as the, as the climate changes around the world, it's not just that we don't have enough water, it's not in the right places for human beings to have access to it. And so that will cause people to move and migration will cause problems as well, both for access, not just not just to water, but also to food and other resources. But when you travel around making your presentations, what, what is the question that is most frequently asked? People are, in the United States are most concerned about bottles. So relative to the business model that we created, they're most concerned about uh, the amount of trash that bottled water companies produce, which I can understand. I think if, if it was Coke or Pepsi or Nestle, I think I could understand their concerns uh, at a visceral level. We didn't really increase demand f for the bottled water industry. And, and my answer to them is always that I don't encourage people to drink bottled water. Uh, I saw an industry where there was a possibility to get people to pay attention through the use of that industry. Um, but if bottled water went away, I think for the planet that probably would be a good thing. Great. Well, thank you for joining us today, Mr. Thum. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF.